Hello teams, welcome back to our technical training session. This is training session number three, getting started with computer-aided design. Um, I am here with Nick and Mac from Rev Robotics. They're going to go through things with you today. Uh, most of the questions we're going to be going through are the ones we submitted on the form in advance. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat on YouTube as we go. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them. If you could just please keep them to the topic we're currently discussing. And also, as you know, SOLIDWORKS is offering scholarships to our teams this year, both SOLIDWORKS Desktop and 3D Experience. So Rep Robotics will be doing this tutorial using SOLIDWORKS, but they'll also be addressing many aspects that are general to all sorts of CAD software. So with that, I guess let's get started, guys. All right. Okay. Sounds so uh, like Stephanie said, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer here at uh, Rev Robotics. Um, so I'm going to be walk, walking through a lot of things uh, with SOLIDWORKS today. I've been using SOLIDWORKS for a little over a decade now, um, so it's kind of just what I'm most familiar with. Um, so we can jump right in. Um, we had a lot of common questions about um, specifically like just general good design practices and, and how to get started. And I think that's always one of the things that people struggle with the most is, um, you know, like with a lot of things, Computer-aided design and, and you know, SOLIDWORKS, as an example, is really just a tool. Um, it's not like it's going to come up with a design for you. It's just a way to design something. Um, so, you know, a, lo a lot of times people, I think, struggle with what I kind of call like the, the blank canvas issue of just like, you know, when you start out, you know, I just opened up a new part here. It's like, there's nothing there, right? Like, I have to come up with everything myself. Um, and so that's always the biggest challenge. Um, and this is where, kind of making sure you're understanding what, what you're designing for, what problem are you trying to solve, what are the constraints of that problem that you need to work around, um, what are different features you're trying to design to have. It's important to, to identify those things because if you kind of just start designing things without really having identified any of those things, um, you're, it's going to be harder in a way because you're, you're kind of going to have anything you can do as an option, which is good create, you know, from a creative standpoint, but it's good to have constraints as well to help kind of funnel you in a direction that's going to lead to success. Um, so I think that's always an important thing to do. Um, as far as the tool itself goes, um, like this is how SOLIDWORKS will look when you open up a new part. So I should actually probably show that. So this is kind of what it looks like when you open it. Um, if you want to start a new file, you obviously just go to File and then New, just like most programs. And then you're going to see this pop up. And um, you know we have some of our internal templates here. But you know normally you're going to see Part. You're going to see assembly, and you'll see drawing. So those are kind of your three different file types um, in SOLIDWORKS. So a part file is simply just a single part, you know, whether it's a wheel or it's a piece of extrusion or you know any kind of singular part. Um, an assembly is where you're going to put all of those parts together into, you know, like like if you were taking a bunch of parts physically and you were assembling them into whatever you're going to build. That's what assembly is in, um, in CAD. And then drawing is where you're going to make a 2D drawing of parts. So a lot of times this is used for when you need to make a drawing of a part that you're going to ma manufacture. You might make a 2D drawing that shows, you know, these are the critical dimensions. You know, we want to make the extrusion this long and you'll spec that out. Or, or this hole is this size, that kind of thing. That's where a drawing comes into view. So those are kind of your three different options. So normally you start with parts. Um, just because if you don't have anything, if you don't already have parts that you're building something with, then you need to start by creating parts. Um, in, in First Global's case, if, if you're using um, like a lot of our rev parts from the, from the kit, you actually might be able to start with an assembly because you can immediately start by taking in some of the different files of the different parts that you get in the kit, like I said, like wheels or things like that, and you can start putting them in an assembly and immediately start assembling them um, like you would in real life. Um, in a lot of ways, I actually like starting this way because Again, it gives you a jumping off point, it's so that way you're not staring at a blank screen. You have, okay, here are some parts. It helps you visualize things quicker. Um, so, but if you do start with parts, here, here's what it would look like as if you create a new part. Um, so you've got some different toolbars. Um, over here on the left is what's called the feature tree. So the feature tree is basically where everything's going to be listed as I create a part. And so this is kind of like the running history of how you created the part as you go. Um, up here are different tools that allow you to create a part. So usually the first thing you do when you're starting by uh, making a part is you're going to go over to Sketch. So the Sketch tool is one of the most useful parts of, of SOLIDWORKS. 
um, is kind of where you can start defining everything. So a lot of you go you go to sketch, and then you're going to click up here, which is to create a new sketch, and it's going to ask you to pick a plane. So you're going to uh, choose choose which plane you want to start on. You know, we'll just choose the front plane for now, and then from here is where you're going to start sketching things. So there's all these different options at the top left. You got line, circle, rectangle. You have polygons and arcs and all these different kinds of things. So you can start by just you know, drawing lines. And, and the nice thing about SOLIDWORKS is you just kind of start by drawing things and then you, you add dimensions later. So you can kind of just keep going. Um, or you can, like I said, you can draw circles. And then there's different ways, obviously, to draw them. You can draw from the center point and work your way out. You can, um, you can do three tangent points where you're just kind of choosing the edges of the circle. So, and all these have different use cases depending on uh, what you're trying to do. Um, knowing how to select things is important as well. Um, so you can see right now, if I, if I click and drag, I kind of get like this selection rectangle, where if I do this, everything kind of turned light blue here. So that means I've selected all of them, and I can you know, delete them, I can move them, I can do whatever. So I'm, I'm going to delete these, because I was just kind of um, showing examples. So let's say you know, we were just going to start by um, making a piece of tube. Um, so I could click the rectangle button here, and then there's different ways to draw the rectangle. So I can actually choose to start by the center point, and then draw my way out. And so now I have you know, a rectangle that I can click and move around. So if I want this to be a square, this is where uh, what are called sketch relations can come into play. Um, sketch relations are really useful as well. Um, so I can click this first line, and then if I hold control down and I click the second line, I now have both of, those, both of these edges selected. And then what pops up over here are some different relations that I can add. Um, so for example, I can make the two lines equal to each other, and if I do that, now this is a square, and while I can, chill, I can change the size of the square, it always stays a square. So that's pretty helpful. Um, there's other, you know, you can make lines horizontal or vertical uh, locked in that orientation. Um, uh, these are already horizontal because it was drawn that way. Um, so, so relations are really good for kind of constraining lines and, and circles and all these different things in the sketch itself, um, which helps, you know, better define the sketch so that things don't move around. Um, so for example, so now I have this square, I can dimension it. So let's say I want to make this um, you know, 15 millimeters. Um, so the first issue actually is that right now I'm in, uh, I'm in the standard dimensioning system, so I probably want to switch over to metric. So um, this little gear in the top center here is where your options menu is. And if I click on that, I can go over to my document properties, and then there's, a, there's an option here for units. And if I click on that, I have a bunch of different unit options. So I can switch to millimeters, grams, et cetera, um, which is probably what we want to work in here. So, so now if I click on that, now you can see I've got my 15 millimeters. And if you notice, everything turned black. So in, and in sketches in SolidWorks, if you see something is blue, it means it is not fully defined, which means um, it's not locked in a position. I can still click it and drag it around and move it. It hasn't been constrained to a position. If it's turned black, um, that means that it is now constrained, it is locked in place. So because I made these two sides equal to each other, and I defined at the center point right here at the origin, and then I defined my size, there's nothing else about this that is unconstrained. It is now constrained, which is a good thing. Um, the reason that's important is a lot of times down the road as you're designing further and further, if you have things that are unconstrained, uh, that leads to the potential of like accidentally um, modifying those those items without realizing it, and then you know you have issues down the road. Um, sometimes what you might see is if you over constrain an item, it'll turn a yellow or red color. So like right now, this is a horizontal line, but if I add a vertical relation to it, it doesn't like that. So what happens is now this turns red, and everything else is yellow. So red means, and you can actually see in the bottom right hand corner here. Uh, actually, my my screen might be blocking it, but red, red basically means. Uh, it is unsolvable, or it is over-constrained. And yellow means uh, that it has a conflict because of another item. So because this item is unsolvable, all of these items are now um, have conflicts because of this line. So if you ever see yellow or red lines in your sketches or anything, it means somewhere along the way you've over-constrained your, your sketch, and that's something that you want to fix. So luckily, uh, all, the, all the relations kind of show up as these little squares. And you can actually click on these when you're in the sketch. And if I click on that and hit delete, it gets rid of that. And now we're, we're back to being in our fully constrained position. So that's really useful. Um, so that kind of shows some of the basic sketch tools. 
Um, there's, there's more additional tools that are, can be useful, uh, for example, like offset entities. If, we were, if we're making a tube here, you know, right now this is just solid, but let's say we want to make it you know, like a square tube. I can click on one of these lines of the perimeter and I can click offset entities, and you can see there's this little yellow projection showing up, um, and this is going to be an offset. So this is a ten, right now it's a 10 millimeter offset. Well, we don't want that much. Maybe we want a 2 millimeter offset. We can type in 2, and now it's um, offsetting all of those lines outwards 2 millimeters. Um, but maybe we want it to be inside. We want the outside of the tube to be 15 millimeters like we defined. So what we can do is we can click reverse here, and now it's switched that to the inside of the square. And then we simply hit our check mark, and now you can see it added a 2 millimeter dimension right here. And, uh, and now we have what looks like the side profile of a piece of tube. So we're pretty happy with that. Now we want to we wanna extrude that. So um, if we click over to our Features tab here in the top left, this is where you really start to create the three-dimensional bodies for parts. So the, the most common use is uh, the extruded boss base. So that's pretty much, if you click on that, what it's going to do is it's going to figure out the param like what you sketched out, and then it's going to extrude that, that area. Um, so by nature, because I have a, a one square inside of another, it automatically assumes I want to extrude the area in between those two layers. If I wanted to extrude the middle as well, I could actually click Selected Contours down here at the bottom. I could click in here, and now it'll actually extrude just the inside instead, because sometimes you do need, want to do that. Now in this particular case, I'm going to exit out of that, and in, our, in this particular case, we were happy with how this is doing, so we want to keep that. So now we can define how long we want that part to be. So this is where you have to know maybe what you're looking for. And if you don't know for sure, you can always start with an arbitrary length, and then you can come back later and adjust it. So maybe for this, we want 100 millimeters long. And you can see that now it's, it's changed the length to be that. Some of the other things you can do in here, for example, is um, how it's going to extrude the part. There's some different options. Um, you see like up to vertex, up to surface. If you have existing surfaces in your part already, you can actually click other things to, to have this extrusion relate to. Uh, obviously, we don't have that yet. This is the first thing we've done on this part. So blind is normally what you would use. Uh, the other option that I often use is called midplane. And what midplane does is it, it does the same extrusion of 100 millimeters long, but it splits it between the two sides of that plane that you did your sketch on. So that, that can be helpful because now if I hit the check mark, you can see my front plane is centered on my part. So that can be helpful because if you start doing that on a lot of your parts, they all, and, and all of your parts have a similar center line, well then you can start you know, assembling all of them via your, your, you know, your, your origin planes, which can help uh, as well with keeping your files organized. So, so this is an example of creating a part. Now maybe the next thing we want to do is we want to have a couple holes on this part, because you know, we're going to mount something to it maybe. Uh, the next thing you would want to do is you'd add holes. So there's a number of ways to actually do this. A uh, simple way is to create another sketch, like we did the first time, and then it's going to ask for you to select a plane or a face. So we could uh, expand our little tree up here, and we could choose one of our origin planes, or we can actually click on one of the faces of the part we just created, and uh, we can immediately start sketching on that surface. So if we want to add a hole, maybe we want to add a hole down the center, we can just simply draw a circle, and then we just have to dimension the circle. So we click our, our I, I realized I breezed past that. So we have our smart dimension button up here. There's a little arrow down below, and there's a, actually a few different options for ways you can dimension. Most of the time, um, smart dimension really actually does the job for you. It very easily kind of figures out what you're trying to dimension, um, because you can, you, know, you can click on a line here, and you can click on the circle, and then it'll automatically figure out you know, you're trying to dimension that way. But for this, in this case, we want to just dimension the diameter of the circle. So we can just click on the circle, click in the empty space, and it'll immediately open up a dialog box for us to type in our dimension. Let's say we're going to do a three millimeter hole because we're using uh, you know, M3 hardware. Um, then you would do that. And now you have a hole, or you have a circle, and then we need to create a hole from this. So what we can do is we can go back to our Features tab. This is where we had extruded the, the tube but we actually want to cut some material away because we're going to cut away a hole from that material. So this is where extrude cut is one of your next most common tools that you're going to use in SOLIDWORKS. Is if you click extrude cut, you can kind of see this yellow projection is showing the material it's going to cut away from your part. So in the same, same way as we did with the extrusion, if you do blind, you can kind of just 
you can dimension what you want this to be. So we know our tube's 15 millimeters long, or 15 millimeters tall, so we can type in 15 millimeters, and, uh, and then it would do that. But another thing you can do on this one is you can actually arrow down and you can click through all. And if you click through all, it'll just automatically make sure that that hole goes through the entire part, no matter how long. And that's helpful because if I, if I had done the blind hole and I typed in 15 millimeters, well, if I go back later and I change the size of this tube, my hole is still only going to be projected 15 millimeters down. So if I made this a 30 by 30 tube, well, I wouldn't, now I wouldn't have the hole going through both sides anymore. So that's where the through all it helps because if I change any of this geometry later, it'll automatically update with that. So there's like a simple way to make a hole. There's also other ways to do holes. For example, there's the hole wizard tool, which is a little more complicated. Um, this can be helpful if you know you want specific holes for you know, clearance for a piece of hardware, like an M3 screw, for example. Um, you know, it, it has a, a library of dimension, of pre-dimensioned holes where you, you just say, okay, I want this to be a screw clearance hole for an M3 size screw, and it'll automatically size the diameter for you, and then you just have to choose where you want the hole to be. So those can be the helpful, those are a little more advanced. So to start out, just doing simple sketches and extrude boss bases and extrude cuts uh, will get you pretty far on, on cutting some different parts. So once you have a part, you obviously want to save it. Um, I'm just going to save this to my desktop as, you know, part two, because that was the default name it was given, just since this is an example. And, uh, and now we can actually start looking at assemblies, which are, in my opinion, actually where a lot of the design comes into play. So we're going to click New, and then we're going to click Assembly here, and hit OK. And now we have our assembly open up. And right off the bat, it's going to have a little Begin Assembly uh, on the left-hand side, and it's going to say, you know, do you have parts that you want to import in? So we can see our little part two that we just created here is already listed because we still have it open. So I can simply click on that and drag it in, and now we're away. So like I mentioned earlier, this is the feature tree. If I actually go back to the part that we are working on, you can see in the feature tree here we have two items. We have boss extrude one and cut extrude one. So these are actually showing each feature that we did that we created to result in this part. So, and this is actually the roll bar. So I can actually roll this backwards, and if I roll to here, now you can see the part's gone. If I roll this forward one, now you, this is, you can see that this is where we extruded the, the tube. And then if I roll this one further down, you can see that's where we added the hole. So this kind of shows you the entire progression of how you create the part. So as you get to more and more complicated parts, this tree will get longer and longer, and when you need to edit a part down the road, you come in here, and you're going to you know, right-click on one of these and click Edit Feature. And if I click that Edit Feature, well, now I'm back to where I created this. And you know, it says 100 millimeters, but maybe I decided mm, I actually need this to be 200 millimeters long. I can, I can change that value and hit the check mark. And now that part's changed while everything else under it's the same. So that's a, that's a way to edit parts. So assemblies work in a similar way. If I go back to my assembly now, Assemblies have a, feet, have a tree, but this is really just your assembly tree. And what this is going to show is it's going to show every part that you have in the assembly. So right now you can see we brought in our tube, and it lists our part in there. Um, and if I want to bring in another part, if I go to my assembly tab at the top left here, there's an insert components button, and I can click on that, and I could bring in another one of my tubes, and now there's two of them. So you can see that there's two different ones listed in our tree over here. Now this one has a little F next to it. The first part you bring into assembly by default will be fixed in its location. So if I click on this guy, I can't drag him anywhere. He's fixed. Whereas the second guy I brought in, you can see he's got a little dash. If you see the dash, it means he is not fully constrained, and you can kind of just move him about the space. So this is where mating comes into play. Mates are the biggest thing that you're going to use when it comes to assemblies in, in SolidWorks and really any, any CAD platform. Mates are kind of what define the relations between two parts to each other. So this one's already fixed, but I want to mate this one to this one. And maybe what I want to do is I want to have the screw holes that we created on both of these line up so that they can pivot on one each other. So the first thing I'm going to do is I want this one to be on top of this one. So what I can do is I can click Mate. Mate is in the top left here under the Assembly tab. If I click Mate, you'll see this little menu pop up. So the blue means you're kind of selected on this area. So the first thing I can do is I can click the top face of my first tube, and you can see that that face popped up in the little selection area, and then this, this part became transparent. So then what I can do is I can kind of rotate around here, 
And uh, in SOLIDWORKS, the default is if you, cl if you click with your scroll wheel, that's what allows you to kind of rotate around the whole assembly. And so then what I can do is I can click the bottom face of our second tube, and you can see the part automatically move down so that now those two planes are in line with each other. And what this is called is a coincident mate. So in SOLIDWORKS, there's a bunch of different types of mates. Um, and really all of them are geometry based. So if you have a, some, some knowledge of basic geometry, um, that, that kind of tells you a lot of what you need to know to understand uh, what all these different tools do. So you have coincident, uh, parallel will make sure that they stay parallel, but they don't necessarily need to be in line with each other. So this would make sure that they remain flat to one another, but I could still move this part all over the place, whereas we want them to be on top of each other, so we would want coincident. You can also do perpendicular, which you can see now makes them those two faces perpendicular to one another. Um, there's some other ones if you're using round features and stuff uh, for, for those. So if we, if we do that, we hit coincident, we can hit the check mark, and that adds that mate. So now you can see I can move this part around still, but if you'll notice, it's always staying in plane with that mate. So that's why mates are so important. So now what we want to do is we want to maybe have these two holes in line with each other because it's going to act as a pivot point. So what we can do is we can click the hole on the one part, and we can click the hole on the other part, and you can see it moved the one to the other, and this is called a concentric mate because the two holes are concentric to one another. Uh, if you wanted to have a tangent, you could do tangent, and now you can see the holes are tangent to one another. Um, that's not something we want to do in this particular application. We do want the concentric, so we want it, uh, we'll switch it back to the concentric. Um, the other thing you can do is you can add lock rotations. So if you don't want it to rotate, then you can choose that, and it'll lock the, the, the part rotationally. Um, we want it to pivot, though, so we're going to not check that. So if we hit our check mark here, now you can see now our part rotates compared to the other one. And it can't move up and down because we locked it with that first mate. So that's how you really start you know, defining how you want things to move about one another, and you can kind of see how parts will react with one another in your model. Um, mates are really how you make all of that happen. And there's more advanced mates uh, that we might not get to today. Um, you know, you can do with mates where you can select two faces of one part and two faces of another, and it'll center the parts on each other, um, which can be helpful. Uh, there are things like linear coupler mates where you can, if you have like a linear elevator system, um, you can kind of, you can make it so that it's got a minimum value and a maximum value so that it can't go any lower than a certain value and it can't go any higher than a certain value. So for something like maybe an elevator system, that can be really helpful because then you can set that mate and then in CAD you can actually drag the whole elevator up and down and you can kind of see its full length of travel without it just being allowed to go you know, infinitely up and down. So that can be really helpful as well. Um, you can do the same thing with angles. If you have an arm, you can kind of set a minimum value and a maximum value so that you can drag it between those minimum and maximum, and it won't be able to overshoot that. Um, so that can be really helpful as well. So all, mates are really how you make that happen. And so just kind of diving into experimenting with the different mates is, is the best way of learning uh, how to utilize those. Um, so this is all great. We have a couple parts here. But maybe we know we want to use um, you know, a standard off common off-the-shelf part, like, you know, something from, from the rev kit, for example, um, then that's something where you'd want to get the part model itself and bring it into SOLIDWORKS instead of designing the entire part yourself. Like, we already have models for you to use for that. So uh, there's a couple ways you can get those. Um, you can visit the rev website and, you know, you can search for, you know, whatever part you're looking for. Maybe we want an Omni wheel. If I search Omni wheel and I find the product I want, I click on the product. Uh, if you look towards the bottom of any product page, we, we have a CAD file link where you basically can click on this and it'll automatically download the part for you as a step file. Um, the other option is you can go to the 3T, 3D Content Central uh, website and if you search Rev Robotics, um, it'll pretty much pop up like all of our different products are on this website as well. Obviously, if you know what specific part you're looking for, you can search for that specific part and uh, it'll pop up. Uh, the part number also, you can search for the part number and it'll pop up. And then you could download the file from 3D Content Central as well. So I already downloaded this file from our website, so I'll use that as an example. Um, so the one thing I like to do is I, well, I actually drag them directly in. So when it's a step model, I'll actually just click on this guy and drag it right in. And it'll, it'll go through some, uh, some processing here just to load the file in. Uh, the Omnibule is 
a little bit longer than most just because it's got so many small parts. But now you can see we've got an Omni wheel in our CAD. So, um, so we really don't have to do anything to this because this is just how the part comes. All we want to do is maybe save it. Um, and this is where having like your own kind of part library can be really helpful. Um, I know in the past, like when I've been working on my own stuff uh, on past robot teams I've been involved with, I kind of just build up a, a CAD library as I go of anytime I use a part, if I don't already have it in my library, I'll go and download it and then I'll save it into my library in some kind of organizational method and then I know that I have it to access for the future. So for now I'm just going to save this to our, to our desktop just since it's an example. Uh, but you can see it's already got the same name and it's going to be saved as a SOLIDWORKS part file, which is SLDPRT, solid part. And uh, we click save on that and now we have this as a SOLIDWORKS file going forward instead of a step file. And if I wanted to add this to my assembly, I can click on my window here. If you click window at the top, you notice I do this. If you click window, it'll kind of show you all the different files you have open. So you can see we've got our first part that we made open and we have our assembly open. I click on that. We can go back to our insert components and then we can click on our Rev 41-1160 and now you can see I'm able to place this in somewhere. And then from there you can make this similar to how I was showing uh, mates with everything else. If for some reason we wanted this wheel centered on those two holes, um, you know, you could click on your surface, click on the other surface, and now you can see those are planar to one another. And now uh, I can click on this round boss of the wheel, and I can click on the round surface of the hole, and you can notice, you can always click the check mark over here. Uh, there's also a little pop-up that'll kind of always show up that are like, make it so you can kind of click stuff quicker. So a lot of times you can just click the check mark there, and now you're good. And now you can see that we've got a wheel that are centered on those same two holes, and that is able to spin. So this is obviously a weird uh, example, but this was just kind of just to quickly show the basics of how you create parts and assemblies um, in SolidWorks. So, hey, um, Nick, did, yeah. Yeah, so we have, we have a couple of other questions. I, I think this is kind of a good part to jump in with, uh, with the Rev part library to some degree. One mm -hmm. of the big ones that we had that came through were, so like folks are used to using like their prototypes and they're like building in the real world because they have like a game ball or, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the cube or something else. Uh, and they're now looking at trying to figure out ways of being able to put this design into CAD. So what are some easy ways of being able to take, like, let's say, the preset lengths of 15 millimeter extrusion and being able to get those down to, you know, you start with your 420 millimeter and get that down to size or maybe you're modifying a bracket or something along those lines. What are some tips to make that process a little bit easier? Sure. So, so right off the bat, like I said, we have CAD models for all the different parts that already exist in the Rev uh, family. So you can kind of go to our website, like I said, and you know you go through the, the subfolders, you can find 15 millimeter extrusion here, or you know maybe even a better example for this would be uh, our channel system. And we go find our, our C channel here. Let's just, let's use this guy as an example. So like I said, you can download this guy, there's the CAD file for it. And then I'm going to drag him into our SOLIDWORKS program. I'm going to process for a second. So now you can see we've got our piece of extrusion. So if you don't already have this in your library, you can obviously save it. So I'll do that real quick just so we have it to use. But maybe your team decided you didn't quite need this long of a piece. You had to chop some of it off. Um, so what you can do is once you download this file, if you need to modify it, um, there's, you, can, you, can, you can still do you know, you can still create a sketch and then, you know, do your extrude cut to kind of cut some of the part away just like you would in real life. Um, one suggestion I would have though is if you're going to do that, I would do a save as. So if you click up by the save uh, floppy disk icon here, you can click save as. And what you'll want to do is maybe add a modifier to this name. If you know how long you're going to cut it down to, you know, maybe we're going to cut it down to 100 millimeters. I would maybe throw that on your part name. Just because if you if you take the normal part number and then you start modifying it and you and you keep the same part number, if you want to use that same piece of extrusion in the future, but you did want the full length of how it comes from us, um, the problem is now it's already been modified. So um, you maybe want to keep organization of like if you're going to have different cut lengths of extrusion, um, you want to keep keep different files for that. So that way you can use that library as a reference library for any design going forward in the future. Um, so now that we have that, you know, I said 100 millimeters, 
just as an example. So let's say we actually want to cut this down to 100 millimeters. So what we can do is we can click on one of our faces here. We can create a sketch. And then if we draw a rectangle here, we grab one of our corner edges here, and we just kind of draw it up. If you notice, the part that exists already, if I kind of grab those edges, they kind of turn orange as you hover over them. And now you can see that these lines are actually black, which means they're already constrained because because I grab that corner, it's automatically got a coincident mate to that corner. So that corner is locked in. And then I had this coincident to the edge of the part, which means all of this is constrained. So the only thing that's not constrained now is actually how tall I'm going to make this rectangle. So I want to make the part that we have currently 100 millimeters long. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to create a dimension from the edge of this part, and I'm going to grab this blue line here, and then I'm going to type in 100 millimeters. Now again, uh, we are in inches right now, so I'm going to switch that over. Just because uh, for all of our FTC parts, we're in the metric system. So, so now you can see that's 100 millimeters. So we have a rectangle here that's cutting away the rest of the part. So if I actually click on features now and extrude cut, then I can do through all, which makes sure it cuts away all of the part. And if I hit the check mark, now you can see it cut all that material away, and now we have a piece that's exactly 100 millimeters. And if you ever want to check that, uh, a nifty tool here is if you go to the evaluate toolbar, you can click on evaluate and then measure. And if I click on measure, I can click on the end face here, and if I rotate over, I can click on the end face on the other side, and you can see that it says 100 millimeters. So we definitely have a part now that is 100 millimeters long. So if you're ever doing things like you're taking any of our extrusions and you're cutting them a specific length for a certain application you have, uh, this is a good way to do it. Um, like I said, you just want to maybe be smart about how you're, you're doing your file management to make sure um, that if I want to use this part and I also want to use the full length part like that it normally comes as, I, this hasn't overwritten that. So that's a, that's a good tip. Uh, Mac, what other questions did we maybe have? Yeah, so a few of the other ones that we also have is like is actually just around setting up like the initial setup of a part library. Do you have any tips from your experiences working with teams uh, on ways of being able to set up a part library to be able to work collaboratively? I know that one specific example that we had was like team members where there maybe wasn't a naming convention that was set up uh, for the different parts when they were getting when they were doing some adjustments to, you know, extrusion lengths or to a mm -hmm. bracket or something along those lines. Yeah, so um, the first thing is, I think it, it depends on your team, um, and then, like it depends, you know, I, I have experience in FRC, first robotics competition, where we're, we're maybe getting parts from a lot of different vendors and things, so I've had times where we actually organize our parts by what vendor they're coming from, you know, so we're, we're buying from a number of different companies. Uh, for something like First Global, though, it might make more sense to really just organize your part library by, by part types. You might have a hardware folder where you save files for all your different screws and nuts and, um, and those small items, bearings. Um, and then you might have a structure folder where it's all the different types of extrusion, whether it's you know, the C-channel, uh, the U-channel, you have your normal 15 by 15 extrusion, um, and you kind of save all your different variants of that. Um, back to like the different lengths of extrusion, um, like I said, one thing you can do is kind of like what I did here, where you, you keep the part number and then you maybe add the specific length that you cut it to onto the end. I've seen that done. Um, for the more advanced users, there are things you can do with what are called configurations, um, where you can create multiple configurations within a part number. And what you could do is you could, you could add a configuration where you say, I want a 100 millimeter long configuration of this extrusion, and then by switching configurations, I can switch between, you know, the default's always the default, but then, you know, I can click on 100, and I can, I can set up my features here so that depending on what configuration I'm in, it'll change the extrusion length. Um, it's a little more advanced to set something like that up, um, but that can be really useful because then, you know, you don't have a million different file, you know, parts. You just have a couple files of just the extrusion type, and then you're just configuring what length you want them to be in real time. Um, so that can be a nice way to do it. Uh, that takes a little more knowledge of how to set up configurations, which I don't really have time to dive into here. Um, but if you're interested in that, I would, I would recommend you know, searching on the internet, um, you know, SolidWorks configuration, extrusion, something like that, and I bet you, um, you'd find some pretty good examples of, of how to set that up. Um, but yeah, otherwise, I think just kind of grouping files, files by um, different part types, extrusions, um, 
you know, bearings, hardware, wheels would be probably a good category for different wheel types, um, gears, pulleys, you know, all those different kinds of things. That way when you know, oh, I'm, I'm doing this system and I'm going to run it with chain, I can just immediately, you know, when I'm in my assembly, if I switch over to my assembly here, I can just hit, you know, insert components, and then if I hit browse, wherever my, you know, library is located on my local network, then I can click that folder, click, you know, my sprockets folder, and then I immediately am looking at the sprockets I care about, and I'm not looking through, you know, 100 different parts trying to find what I'm looking for. Um, so that can be a really good way to organize stuff like that. That's a really good, that's a really good uh, set of tips, Nick, because I, I know that that's one of the large scale challenges that folks have is you, you just, mm -hmm. you, you have all of these parts and it can yeah. be very, very difficult to be able to find exactly what you're looking for when you're looking for it. Uh, another really big question that we kind of have that's coming up is, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, is it's kind of the blank slate problem where mm -hmm. a lot of people, they're new to using a CAD software, they're new to doing robot design. And when you have like a blank page and it's, you know, the challenge is you need to pick up a round object, like let's say a ball that's like a hundred millimeters, you know, and you need to take this thing and bringing it, bringing it in your robot, scoring it into a high goal, um, being able to kind of break those things down into chunks to be able to start doing some, I guess, virtual prototyping to some degree in, the, in like something like SOLIDWORKS. So I, I know like inside of our office, I know that we've used the term Crayola CAD. Do you mind showing a couple of uh, yeah. examples of potentially doing that? Yeah, so I think the first thing I know when I'm, whenever I'm designing something, I always start with a 2D sketch. Um, and this is where, you know, CAD is useful. This is definitely something you can do with just starting on a piece of paper. I mean, that, that's how things used to be done 30 years ago before we all had computers and internet and everything was you just did everything on paper. Um, it's really no different here. I think CAD makes it easier in a lot of ways because you can more quickly and easily have things scaled at the right sizes and more realistically kind of know what you're looking at. So to do something like that, yeah, you just start by creating a new part just like we did earlier, and then you're gonna go to your sketch and create a new sketch. You're gonna choose a plane, so I'll choose the right plane for this one. Um, so yeah, you use the example of like, you know, picking up a ball is just a basic example. So, you know, blank canvas, how do we start from there? So first thing I might do is I might, you know, draw a line here that's just, and this is just going to be the floor. This is just representing the floor. And one thing you can actually do whenever you're doing some sketches like this, uh, there's a couple options over here. You can, there's a for construction option that you can check on, and if you do that, it'll turn it into a dotted line, um, which can be helpful once you start sketching a lot of lines and things. Um, sometimes it can be a lot to look at, especially if they're all solid lines. So if you can have some dotted lines, it can make things a little easier to look at. Um, and the other thing you can do is there's an infinite length option. So for something like this, where this line's representing the floor, um, this can actually be useful because then if I, if I check out of that, you know, no matter how far I zoom out, you can't even really tell I'm zooming out because it's not moving. Now you can tell I'm zooming in. The line's just always going to be there. So that way, regardless of how big my drawing gets here, you know, that, that line doesn't go anywhere. So for, for something like, you know, I'm just trying to represent the floor here, that can be useful. So the next thing is if we're going to look at, you know, in taking a ball, well, we can draw the ball as a good place to start. So I draw a circle. And if you notice, when I click the center point and I drag down here, um, here, I'll do that again because I kind of did it quickly. I click on my center point, and then if I'm here, you can see that that line's turning orange, and there's a little tangent uh, symbol popping up there next to my cursor. So if I click on that, what it's doing is it's automatically adding a tangent um, relation. So you can see that that tangent relation is there between the line and the circle. So that way, it's automatically making it so that my ball is now tangent with the floor. Now I need to define the size of the ball, so uh, we're just kind of arbitrarily doing this, so um, let's say this is a 100 millimeter ball. Okay, so now we're in there. So here's our ball. Uh, we're actually showing in inches again, so sorry. My, my default for SOLIDWORKS is uh, inches, so I have to keep changing this for you guys, but uh, there we go, 100 millimeters. So a lot of ways you can bring in a ball. So the question is, how do we want to do it? You know, you know, you could have a roller, you could have a claw, uh, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, maybe for this example, we'll look at having a roller of some type. So, you know, if this is basically a side view of our robot. So I click the right plane. So we're essentially looking at a side view of the robot. Um, one thing you can actually start by doing is maybe just drawing in some semblance of a drivetrain, just so you can kind of tell this is where my robot is. So, you know, maybe we want to draw a chassis that's um, 
you know, usually they're 18 inches, so that would be, you know, around 450 millimeters about. So we're going to say our chassis is 450 millimeters long, and uh, let's say it's 45 millimeters tall. That's how tall the channel is, our, uh, our Rev-C channel. So, you know, there's our chassis. We need some wheels, um, so we can kind of just draw in some quick circles that are, again, tangent to the floor to represent our wheels. And here's, here's another example of relations. I drew my two circles, but they're both wheels, and I know I want wheels that are the same size, so I can kind of select both of my wheels here, and I can click Equal, and now they'll be the same size wheel. Now I need to define what size wheel, so, um, you know, maybe we'll do, um, we'll do 75 millimeter diameter wheels, say. Um, and this just kind of gives you a rough, now you can kind of see, okay, well, here's my drivetrain. Gives, my, gives me an idea, okay, this is how big the ball is relative to the drivetrain. So right off the bat, it's helping with kind of getting a sense of what the scale of everything is. Now our wheels aren't really locked relative to our drivetrain, and actually our drivetrain's not locked either. Um, so maybe one thing we want to do is we want to center the wheels on the drive rail. So one thing we can do is we can actually right click on this line, you can select midpoint. And if you do that, then I can also hold control down and click on the center point of my circle that's representing my wheel and I can hit horizontal, and if I do that, now you can see that my channel moved up just a little bit, and now these lines are black, because the height is fixed. Um, and then all I have to do is define the wheels relative to the end of my drive tube, so we're just gonna, we'll just kinda make that up. Let's just call it maybe 40 millimeters, eh, let's call it 50 millimeters. And we'll do the same thing on the back side, just so uh, these things are kinda locked in place. The more we lock in place, um, the easier kind of everything becomes. So now we have our drivetrain. It's able to move around. Um, for something like this, though, where you're trying to figure out maybe how to intake a ball, you don't really need to see the drivetrain moving in your sketch. It's, it's easier if it's kind of just stuck in place. So you can kind of have everything move around it. So we're going to kind of lock that in place. I grabbed the line and the origin, and I just made a coincident relation. Um, so you can see that that got added. And so now, now everything's black, the drivetrain is not going to move at all. So now I just have my ball. So here's my ball rolling along the floor. So now the question is, if I'm going to have a roller kind of maybe bring that ball in, where do I need the ball to be? So, or where do I need the roller to be, I should say? So, and this is where something where prototyping is still really important. And that's, a, that's maybe an important thing to stress right now is that designing in CAD is not necessarily a substitute for testing things in real life, especially early on. If you're designing a robot, to pick up a ball in this example, um, it's still really important to start by just building some things in real life and getting a feel for how does the ball interact with different parts. You know, if I'm going to have a roller, you know, is it important that I have a soft roller that's got some compression to it? Do I want something that's really rigid and hard? Probably depends on the ball. It depends on if the ball is soft or hard or, or other different characteristics. So um, CAD is really helpful for making sure you really flesh out your design, especially for kind of getting the final version of what you want your robot to be in, in those hard, specific dimensions. Um, and it can also help with just getting a good idea of maybe what you want to build or what you want to prototype. Um, but it's important to also do those tests in real life. Um, CAD is not just a substitute. You can't, you know, in most cases you're not going to design everything in CAD the first time and then magically have a robot that works the first try. You know, even, you know, here at Rev when we're designing new products, I mean, we, we start with design in CAD a lot, but like there's still going to be revisions where we're going to prototype different things and how we want things to work. So it's important to understand that they, they work together. It's not one or the other. Um, but if we think we're going to have a roller here to, to maybe suck this ball into the robot, um, you know, we have to decide, well, how big is the roller going to be? And then where is the location of the roller relative to not only the ball, but the robot itself? You know, can the roller really be outside the frame of the, of the drivetrain? Maybe not. Maybe we want it to be inside. So right off the bat, we know we don't really want the roller to go any further than here. So we can start by maybe adding a dimension relative to the drivetrain to say, from the front of the drivetrain to our roller here, you know, maybe we don't want it, you know, if we put it to maybe 25 millimeters, well now we've fixed the, the roller in that direction and now we can only move it up and down. And we can change the size of the roller. So we also have to decide, okay, well what size do we think we want the roller to be uh, and how high up do we want it to be? Well the height of the roller is probably driven by the height of the ball. But it's also driven by the size of the roller because if I have a smaller roller, that means the roller needs to be smaller, right? Because now my radius is smaller. If I make the roller bigger, then I maybe want my roller to be higher up. But the other thing is you have to think about how these actually interact with each other. And this is kind of where I go back to you have to understand what components you're using. 
if this is a hard rigid roller and this is a soft ball maybe as an example well i don't want these to be perfectly in line with each other where this guy is like perfectly tangent to the ball because in reality what will happen is the roller will not really contact the ball or it'll barely contact the ball because it's just touching at the very tip of the ball which means you won't actually get a lot of you know intaking force as an example so this is where you would have to you know figure out well how much interference between the roller and the ball do I actually want and this is something where you can kind of start guesstimating in CAD but this is where prototyping in real life also helps because you can start testing in real life well, how high should that roller be and then once you've kind of figured that out in prototyping you can go okay well I know I want this to kind of be you know uh, five or ten millimeters of interference and so what I can do is I can click my roller and click my ball it automatically creates a dimension but this is measuring from the center points and I actually want to measure the interference here so what I can do is I can go over to this menu over here and I can select minimum for each value and now I can kind of I can kind of spec out what I want my interference to be so maybe I decided I want 10 millimeters of interference there so now we have another definition of what that is now we just have to decide how big our roller is and in this case maybe it's um, maybe it's a 50 millimeter diameter roller so now we have a lot more stuff backed out the roller can still move only relative to the ball though and we know we want this while while the ball's directly under the roller so now we can say okay let's make the ball and the roller vertical with each other and now you can see everything's black so now everything's been defined which means we know exactly the location of our roller relative to our drivetrain and we know that when the ball's coming in when it's directly under the roller we're going to have 10 millimeters of essentially what becomes compression you're either compressing the ball or you're compressing the roller or some combination of both um, so this is like the start of kind of a sketch layout of laying out here's how the robot's going to function so now the next question would be okay well now we started sucking the ball into the robot but it's still touching the floor so how are we going to get the ball off the floor and actually in the robot where if the robot starts moving around the ball is just moving with the you know with the robot it's not still touching the ground so that's where you would maybe start going in and saying okay well maybe I'm going to have a ramp of some kind and I'm going to I'm going to have a surface here and because the roller is touching the ball as this roller is spinning the ball is going to be pushed up and it's going to crawl up onto this ramp and that's where you would start wanting to think through okay well what else is going on the robot where am I trying to get the ball to you know am I just trying to hold the ball am I trying to get the ball to another location in my robot because it's going to feed a shooter or something or am I just trying to hold the ball and then maybe maybe this roller and this ramp are going to lift up by, by some other mechanism and I'm actually lifting the ball up to place it somewhere else um, so those are kind of the different things you would start planning out in this 2D sketch um, so uh, Mac I know it's been about 45 minutes I mean I could either keep kind of going through examples on this or if I don't know if we maybe have some other questions we would want to get to uh, yeah, so we, we there was a question that was around kind of the axis of revolution on on a point for like a linear slide, but I think we kind of touched on that with the the mating type for the yeah. earlier the earlier piece there. Um, there were so, some other questions around uh, some of the other additional things that were in inside of SolidWorks, which is mainly like around drawings and things along those lines. But I, I believe that you need to have a little bit more of a completed part to be able to kind of showcase uh, yeah. uh, some of those. I mean, those I, I, can quickly, I can quickly create a drawing just so people can see what a drawing looks like um, based on like this just example part we kind of created. So once, once you have a part saved, if you go to File and then New, and then this time you're going to click on Drawing, and you hit OK, um, it's going to ask you for like what sheet size you want and all that. Um, if just for normal use case, you can just kind of use whatever the, the default is in SolidWorks. You can kind of see it adds some kind of default uh, template for a, a drawing perimeter. Um, those are all things you can kind of edit later, or you can also create your own templates, uh, which we won't get into now. Uh, but the first thing you're going to do is you're going to want to add a view of your part into the model. Uh, so one thing you can do is you can actually click standard three view, and what that does is it kind of just adds a standard three views of the part that you have. So you can see here, you know, I've got a view that shows the side profile of the extrusion, and then I've got a side view and I've got a top view. And you can see the top view here is where the circle or where the hole we made shows up. And so this is kind of just the basics of what a drawing is. And like I said, the main reasons you're going to create drawings 
are to kind of call out, like, if you're manufacturing a part, okay, this is how it needs to be manufactured, and, and also help show what material it is. So um, on this big of a sheet, you know, this is actually a pretty small scale, so one thing we can do is uh, we can actually right-click on our sheet here. So you have sheet one. You can always add multiple sheets. Um, in most cases, you're only going to have one sheet. You can click on properties, and then you see there's an option for scale here. So I can actually up the scale to maybe two to one, just so everything's bigger and you can see it better. And then from here, you're just going to do things like add dimensions. Anything you would need to know for how, how, how do I need, what do I need to know to make this part? If I was going to can this to somebody else and say make this part, what, what information does the drawing need to convey to them to know how to, how to make it? So for example, in this case, they need to know how long the extrusion is going to be. So I'm going to click both ends of the extrusion, and then you can see the text is very small here, so you would need to play around with some of the sizing and stuff, but you can see it calls out the length here, for example. Uh, you can dimension the holes. So, so that's really all the drawings are. I'm not going to go fully into uh, generating an entire drawing, um, but that's kind of the basics of what drawings are used for. It's, it's primarily for conveying information to people not looking at the model. What is this part? How would you go about making this part? What are the, what's the critical information that somebody needs to know about this part that would be relevant to what you're making? Um, so, so that's kind of drawings in a nutshell. What other uh, questions do we have, Mac? Don't think we have Mac right now. Um, so, so yeah. So I guess back to this this drawing though of just like sketching out your ideas, um, and then something you can do if you want to take kind of the basic CAD to the next level of just being able to kind of see and reference what you're looking at. What you can actually start doing is you can start extruding out, um, like shapes of like the roller and stuff just to get a basic like three-dimensional representation of what you're doing you know you can actually extrude out for example let's try this if I want to extrude out my drivetrain just so I can see it in three dimensions I can actually click all the areas that represent my channel here and then I can maybe switch to mid plane and you know, maybe my, my, if my robot's a square, if it's 450 millimeters long, then it's, let's say it's 450 millimeters wide as well, you know, I can do that and hit OK. And, uh, oops, looks like I missed a spot. This is kind of a quick and dirty way to do it, but I'm just trying to use the example we've kind of already come up with. You know, now that you can kind of see, even though it's just a, a solid square, this is kind of the area of what the chassis of my drivetrain takes up. And if you wanted, you could also add the wheels and then you could start extruding out, um, you know, if I make my sketch visible again so you can see the sketch, you could do another extrusion where you kind of just extrude out my roller to say, okay, well, here's where the roller is. And then also, you know, well, where's the ball going? You know, I need to have a cutout probably in my drivetrain somewhere for the ball to fit. So then that's where you could come in here and I could click this face, click on sketch, and I could, you know, make a rectangle here. And this is the area that I'm going to cut away. Maybe I add some dimensions just to, to have a good idea. Let's say, I don't know, 75 millimeters on each side. And maybe I'm not sure how long, so I'm actually going to leave this undefined. And, uh, and then I can always come back later and change it. And then what I'll do here is I can do features, extrude, cut. And I'll just do through all. So now we can say, okay, this is representing my drivetrain now. You know, I've got my wheels you know, down the sides, so that's why I couldn't cut the whole front away, but I've got this middle area cut away, and, you know, oops, I cut it on the wrong side. Um, oops, that was an accident. Let's fix that. So really, this rectangle actually wants to be on this side. Everybody makes mistakes. So, let's re-add our dimensions back in. We're still not going to define our depth here because we're not maybe we're not sure yet how much space we need. So now you can see, okay, well now this is this is kind of representing our drivetrain, and you can see here's where the ball is, here's where the roller is. So the next thing I can do is I can actually create another sketch, and here's where uh, a tool like Convert Entities is helpful. I can click on this circle that we had in our other sketch. I can click Convert Entities, and now it's added that circle to this new sketch. And so now if I go into extrude and I do another mid-plane and I can say, you know, I want this roller to go across my robot, but I don't need it to go across the entire robot because, you know, it doesn't do any good being above our drivetrain here because it can't touch the ball there. So 
I only needed to do maybe, well, it was 450 plus 75 on each side, so we only need this to be maybe 300 millimeters wide. And then you can hit OK. And now you can see this is, this, this is representing our roller, basically. And you can see if this is our ball, now you can kind of, you can visualize better now in three dimensions. You can kind of see here's where the ball's coming in, and now it's going to need to come up. So that's the next question is, okay, well, where does this ramp go? You know, based on that, does this cutout need to go maybe further back so I have more space for my ball to kind of come into into the robot? Um, so this is kind of like when he was talking about Crayola CAD. That's kind of that's like our nickname for it. It's just kind of very basic shapes just to kind of visualize what it is you're talking about in, in an actual scale of having correct sizing and everything instead of just napkin sketching, which is where you're just going to make a quick sketch on a piece of paper just to kind of get an idea across. That can be good, but Sometimes it's hard to know if, it's, if an ideal is realistic or not because you can't really, you know, you're not necessarily always drawing things at the correct size in proportion to everything else. Um, you can do that via graph paper, you know, where, you, you know, you, you have more idea of what the correct size is and everything. But then this is kind of the next step of that, of like, I know for sure that these are all at the exact right sizes, and now I can kind of visualize in three dimensions more what my idea is. And then from here, you can just start iterating more and more, and then you can slowly start adding detail more and more until you actually start having something that resembles final parts that you can actually design around then. So uh, let's see if maybe we have Mac back, if we have a couple more questions to get to. Yeah, Nick. Uh, so one of the questions that we get uh, pretty frequently, we also had through the questionnaire itself, was like a number of our plastic parts have a lot of like draft angles and other things to mm -hmm. it, which can make doing mating and things like that sometimes a little bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so. Do you have any tips for how to be able to do a, a little bit of an easier job for mates when you have parts that maybe for the manufacturing process end up kind of having things that are, you know, maybe not as flush or easy to mate just by using the default mm -hmm. tools within SolidWorks? Yeah, so, so this OmniWheel that we opened up earlier is actually a good example of that. Um, if you look at like this round surface, uh, if you actually look at it head on, it's not a perfect cylinder. It's got draft on it just because of, uh, you know, the way that these parts are molded. A lot of times they have s small angles on them because it makes the manufacturing process easier. Um, but that means it's not a perfect cylinder. It's, it's a tapered cylinder. Um, so some mates it doesn't affect, some mates it does. Uh, so for like the example we looked at earlier, um, I was actually still able to do a concentric mate um, because SolidWorks is able to calculate out, even though that it's a, a tapered cylinder, it can still, by like when I select this face, it's still able to calculate out the center axis of that, of that wheel. Um, but if there's other cases where maybe it can't, um, there's different things you can do uh, with reference geometry. So if you look at the features tab, which I already have open, all the way over here, uh, you see reference geometry. And if you click the arrow on here, um, you can create planes, axes, uh, points. Uh, you can create these things um, in a part file that then gives you kind of a reference that you can use um, to help with mating. So for example, if I wanted to create a center axis for this wheel, uh, there's a number of ways I could do that. Um, the way that's imported, the first thing I'd actually like to do normally is I actually like to look at my three default planes that are based off the origin. So if you look, there's always an origin point for any part. Most parts hopefully generally have the origin in a pretty common sense location. Like for example, it's in the center of a wheel. Um, depends on where the part's coming from. You might, you might find that maybe the origin's not in the right spot. It's in some random spot in space, so it's not very helpful. Um, the right top and front plane are always based on the origin. So in, in this part's particular case, the origin's in the center of the part. So if I actually look at the right plane, it's going right down the middle of the part. And if I look at the top plane, it's also going right down the middle of the part. So if I wanted to create an axis um, that's going down the center of the wheel, uh, one way to do that is to actually, um, if I select the top plane and I hold control down and I click right plane, I have two planes now. And with geometry, uh, if you have two planes, you can define an axis based on those two planes that is fixed. So if I click my reference geometry and I click axis now, based on those two planes, you can see this yellow dotted line, it's going to add an axis based on those two planes. Um, and so if I hit the check mark, now you can see at the bottom of my feature tree here, it says axis one. And now this axis is here. And if I go back into my assembly now, um, and I expand that part in my, uh, my assembly tree here, I scroll down to the bottom of the tree for that part, you can see my axis is here. So I can actually choose this axis, and I can use that to mate to other parts. 
So on any parts that have drafts and things like that, reference geometry is usually uh, one of the best ways to kind of deal with that. Um, but usually I think for most of our parts, uh, we try to do a, a pretty good job of making sure that um, you, you have parts of, you have areas of the part needed to, to be able to mate in the ways that you would normally be using it. But if you have some different use case or, or it's a different part um, that maybe isn't set up as well, uh, reference geometry is gonna be the way to fix that, so. What else we, uh, what other questions do we have, Mac? All right, so we have time for a couple of more, but one of the ones that has been coming through uh, is around how do you end up just basically designing around some like basically tolerances? So there's been a few people have mentioned things like around like 3D printers potentially, mm -hmm. uh, maybe not for the first global competition, but for projects that they might have at home where an object mm -hmm. might shrink. Or if you're looking at like, you know, you're, you're going to go ahead and drill a hole in a location, but you might not be able to have the machining tools to be able to put it exactly in some location. Do you have any tips for when you're designing parts um, that are getting used for robots to be able to kind of take them into account those tolerancing issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So um, the first part, like, to, so if you're looking at 3D printing as an example, um, a, a generally a good method for 3D printing specifically is you probably know what printer you're using. Um, so you can kind of look at, um, you know, the best way to do it is to maybe print a, a, an example part or a test part on that printer that you, you know, have known dimensions of from, from your CAD model or even just from a spec drawing. And you can then print that model and then once you print the model, then you can look at the part and you can actually, you know, take calipers or some kind of measuring device and you can check all the dimensions of that part and say how accurate is the part physically to what it's supposed to be based on the model. And so then you can say, okay, well, all these dimensions were a little undersized by this amount. You know, if you can maybe um, equate it to some percentage, then you can maybe go, okay, well, in general, this printer ends up resulting in this percentage of shrink rate of the whole part. So then maybe you can know to just oversize everything by a certain amount. Uh, in my experience, most times with 3D printers, usually the, the overall part size doesn't really change as far as like shrinking or anything. Uh, usually where you see it is things like holes um, sometimes it's like the, the print will actually undersize the hole by a little bit. Um, and so a lot of times that's just like a, that's like a learn by using kind of example of just, you print a part and you know, maybe it was a clearance for an M3 bolt. And then when you actually went to put the bolt through the, through the hole, it didn't quite fit, you know, it was a little too tight. So then you kind of know going forward, whenever I'm gonna design a part to print on that printer, you just oversize this hole by this amount is kind of a standard practice. Um, there's also just general tolerancing rules just in the world in general as far as like a close fit versus a normal fit versus a free fit. And a lot of standard, if, if you're looking at like bolt sizes and things like that, um, those are all kind of standardized dimensions that are used in, in the whole world as far as, you know, if you want a close fit for, a, for an M3 bolt versus a, you know, a free fit for an M3 bolt, those are actually spec dimensions that exist out there. So a lot of times referencing those kind of things, and, and all of those are very easy to find online. Um, those are, those are good ideas to use for just general tolerancing. Um, but it is important to think through how you're gonna assemble something as far as thinking through like tolerancing and just how things are gonna fit together. And also just like access to, you know, bolt heads and stuff is, um, one thing that often happens is people design stuff in CAD and they don't think enough about how they're actually gonna physically build it. Because in CAD, you can kind of assemble things like any way you want because you don't need to like use a tool in CAD to assemble something, right? You're just clicking wherever you want. So, but in reality, it's important to think through, okay, well, I'm gonna put this bolt here in CAD, but like in reality, am I gonna be able to get, you know, a tool, am I gonna be able to get a wrench onto that, that screw head to be able to tighten it? You know, you might not be able to. So it's important to think those things through. And as far as tolerancing goes, you know, it's worth thinking through, well, this part is, made, is, is gonna be up against this part and it's also gonna be up against this other part. So if my, if my fit is too tight, I won't be able to fit these parts together. You know, so that's, that's just where I think thinking, the more you get into the process of thinking through how you're actually gonna build it, uh, the better. A lot of times when I'm assembling parts together in CAD, like we did here, I try to actually think through while I'm doing it, how am I, like I try to assemble it in CAD, how I would actually assemble it in real life, because it, it forces me to think through a lot better, like things like, you know, access to screw heads, um, you know, keeping in mind I need space for a wrench to stick through these things or, or, or things like that. So um, that's a really good way to kind of combat a lot of those issues, combat a lot of those issues. Yep. Um, 
Nick, it looks like we're we're about to wrap up here. One of the other yeah. questions that kind of was coming in that we that we had that I think you kind of touched on a little bit here was there was actually a couple of questions on like how far into the details should you put on to your CAD model, right? Like should you go all the way to the point of putting nuts and bolts mm -hmm. in? And I know from my personal experience, like you should get as much stuff into your CAD model as possible. Yeah. So I that mean, you're able to know if you're gonna run into those types of issues. I think it first goes back to what what are the goal like what is it you're trying to get out of using the CAD for? So like the last thing we were looking at was just the 2D sketch example of just trying to get a basic idea onto the computer of like what do we think we want the robot to be. So if that's all you're trying to do in CAD, then obviously detail is not critically important because you're just trying to get a general sense of a concept or a layout of where all these components are gonna go and does this all generally check out. Um, if you're gonna actually just try to design a full robot and you're actually like designing parts to be manufactured and things like that, um, the more detail is always better because uh, like I said, and kind of back to what I just said about assembly, is like adding, making sure you always put all your bolts in and things like that into the CAD model is oftentimes very useful because otherwise if you don't, you might find out that you have a part in the way of where a screw head needs to be when you actually go to physically assemble it because you didn't account for the space that the screw head takes up. Um, and that can really be unfortunate because then you'll be kicking yourself later because you go, oh, now I have to remake this entire part because I didn't account for a screw. Um, so that can be tough. But, you know, it, it is a trade-off of, like, how much, how much time and how much energy is it going to take to, like, populate every single fastener and, and all those types of things. But in general, the more detail uh, is going to be the better. And, and you're going to have less uh, issues that you need to fix down the road when you're actually building uh, what you designed. So. Yeah. Uh, other than that, do you have any uh, any like parting words or any parting kind of tips that that you would generally um, like just to people more in general? No, I think I think just kind of what I said at the beginning to reiterate is is CAD is a really valuable tool and but it, but it's a tool just like any other tool. You can learn how to use it. You know, a lot of the things I was talking about. You know, I, I obviously skipped over like a lot of things I could talk about as far as little tips and little tricks of using SolidWorks as an example. Um, but all those things are all things you can learn. There are so many resources online. Like you said, the tutorials that come with SolidWorks is obviously a very good starting off point that if you really go through all of it, we'll eventually show you like every feature it has. But if you're ever like, oh, I wish I could do this thing, chances are you can, you can search it online and like there are five different people that have like tutorials that'll show you exactly how to do it on YouTube or whatever. Um, so it's really just learning the tool. What, what the real value is is understanding how to approach designing for a project or a solution and understanding that you want to start by making sure you're identifying what you're trying to solve, what are the constraints that you have to work around, and all those types of things. Because the, the better job you do of identifying all those things at the beginning, the more success you're going to have down the road. So. Yeah. Well, and that's that's really really great advice. Um, the for from my personal experience with working with teams, typically the good thing is just you have open communication between people that are doing CAD uh, and and building prototypes to be able to kind of make sure that you're able to close the loop on that process as quickly as you can. Um, but otherwise, that's going to be a wrap from us here at Rev. Thank you, Nick, for all of your advice and help with being able to showcase how to use SolidWorks here for solving some of the problems that might be facing these teams in the future with First Global, but also within their own communities. Uh, and we will see you all hopefully sometime in the future. All right.